ahead and get started because we've got a really exciting opportunity today presentation. My name is Katie Kowalczyk and I am the chair of the Environment and Energy Council at CTS. I work for MnDOT as the Metro Area Water Resources Engineer. And uh, today we are very excited to have uh, our presenters. Thank you all for being here and for your interest in this topic. Our meeting today again is sponsored by CTS's Environment and Energy Transportation Council. So a little background on the councils. The CTS councils provide a forum for transportation professionals and researchers to exchange information on current transportation issues and trends. They bring together university faculty and staff with practitioners from the public and private sectors to recommend direction and participate in improving the center's research, education, and engagement programs. James will share the link to the council's information in the chat shortly. And today's webinar features a presentation on crossings, how road ecology is shaping the future of our planet. I'll share more about this in a moment, but first I'd like to turn it over to our vice chair, Mauricio Leon, who is co-facilitating this webinar. Mauricio, do you wanna introduce yourself? Thank you so much, Katie. Uh, my name is Mauricio Leon, and I am a carbon reduction manager for uh, the Hennepin County. I'm the vice chair of the Environment and Energy Council at CTS. And I'm going to go through uh, some housekeeping items for today. So first is questions and comments. We're looking forward to audience participation and questions during Q&A time, which follows the presentation. We encourage you to use the Q&A at the bottom of your screen at any time to type questions or comments for the speaker. During Q&A, you could use the raise hand feature if you prefer. Then we can unmute you to share verbally. Credit. This event meets the, the continuing education requirements for 1.5 professional development hour credits and 1.5 American Institute of Certified Planners, AICP, certification maintenance credits. The PDH form will be uploaded to the chat for anyone who needs it. Some events. CTS will be holding two or three other transportation research webinars this spring that you might be interested in. On April 30th, from 1 to 2.30 p.m., the Center for Transportation Studies, Transportation Planning, and Economy Research Council is hosting rural community transit strategies, building on expanding and enhance, enhancing existing assets and programs, and MinDOT's mobility as a service platform, assessing user behavior and measuring system benefits. On May 8th, from 12 to 1.30 p.m., the CTS Infrastructure Research Council will be hosting autonomous mobile asphalt density profiling robot to reduce worker risk. Uh, you can see uh, more information on how to register will be available at the CTS website at the link that you see. Finally, if there are any students joining today, could you please send a chat to all panelists with your name? We track the number of students who are engaging in our events. Thank you. And now back to you, Katie. Thanks, Mauricio. I will turn it over to Kyle Shelton now so he can introduce our today's presentation and speaker. Thanks, Katie and Mauricio. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Um, we're really excited to have Ben Goldfarb with us today to share more about his book, Crossings. And I'm going to mostly leave the description and, and dive in for Ben because he knows it far better than I do. But um, it's just great to have him and have him be a part of uh, this. This, uh, In addition to this being a council presentation, this is a, also part of our rural needs and statewide answers theme for this year at CTS. Um, obviously, the landscapes and a lot of the challenges that uh, and opportunities that Ben's going to be talking about are occurring in rural landscapes across the country and across the world. And we obviously have a huge part of, of similar challenges and opportunities in greater Minnesota that I know he's going to touch a little bit on. Um, I also, before we jumped in and before I formally introduced Ben, wanted to thank a couple partners who helped us promote the event today. Um, that includes Our Streets, uh, Move Minnesota, Move Minneapolis, the Sierra Club North Star Chapter, and Bike MN, as well as some UMN partners um, from the Ecology, Evolution, and Biology uh, College, and also from the Bell Museum. So it's great to have uh, so many excited partners sharing with their lists and, and with their um, constituents uh, great events like this. So we're, we really appreciate everybody doing that alongside of us. Um, and then just a flag as well, 
Uh, Gina Boss, James DeSoto, and Sam Handuvel from CTS are on the call alongside myself and Katie and Mauricio. And if you have questions, you can certainly chat to us. Um, and or if there are problems, let us know through the through the Zoom channels, and we will try to do our best to address them. Um, and so with that, I'm I'm really happy to just turn over to Ben. Ben is joining us today. He's an environmental journalist whose work has appeared in a number of locations, including National Geographic, The Atlantic, Smithsonian, and many other publications. In addition to Crossings, How Road Ecology is Shaping the Future of Our Planet, which was named one of the best books of 2023 by New York Times and The New Yorker. Ben is also the author of Eager, The Surprising Secret Life of Beavers and Why They Matter. And I, he was just giving me some advice about how to capture, go see a beaver live, maybe next time I'm down by the Mississippi, uh, which is a life goal for me. So I'm, I'm excited to read that book after uh, hearing more about Crossings today. Um, but with that, Ben, I'll hand over to you and uh, just really looking forward to your talk and we'll return afterwards for Q&A. Fantastic. Well, thank, thank you so much, Kyle, for that introduction. Thanks to Mauricio, Katie, the rest of the team for, for having me. Thanks to all of you for uh, for being here. Uh, you know, one chapter of this book actually features research uh, being conducted at the University of Minnesota on the kind of the relationship between monarch butterflies and uh, and roadside habitats. So we'll, we'll get into that a little bit, but I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, U of M is a, a place that features in this book, and I'm, I'm really appreciative to uh, all of the people who uh, were involved in the creation of this book and are, are having me uh, here today. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, share my screen. Uh, and so this, this book that I'll be discussing in my talk today is about the concept of road ecology, which is basically this field of science that looks at all of the different ways that roads shape and interact with nature. And, you know, I think more important, what we do about those interactions, how we manage uh, the conflicts between ecosystems and wildlife that transportation infrastructure creates. And, you know, roads are so transformative to nature, uh, in large part, of course, because there are just so many of them, right? Uh, we have something like 4 million miles of road uh, here in the U.S. alone. Uh, there are around 40 million miles of road around the world. Uh, and something like 15 million miles more that are essentially in progress that will be built, you know, by the middle of this century or so. Uh, so we're in this era that some ecologists have called the infrastructure tsunami, this you know wave of new construction uh, that's sweeping across the planet with really profound implications for, for biodiversity. And I think that, you know, in part because roads are so ubiquitous, right, we use them every single day, we kind of take them for granted. They're a little bit invisible to us. Uh, and when we do think about them, you know, we think about them in fundamentally positive terms, right? They're these, uh, you know, they're how we get to hospitals and schools and grocery stores. You know, they're these symbols of human mobility and momentum and freedom. You know, Jack Kerouac and Bruce Springsteen, right, the romance of the open road. They're how we get across the landscape. Uh, and I think that that kind of mythos is, is somewhat ironic or paradoxical because of course they do the exact opposite to basically all other forms of life, right? They curtail animal movement and, and mobility and freedom uh, at a truly massive scale. And of course the way they do that most visibly and conspicuously is by killing animals directly, right? Through roadkill. And I think, you know, in part because you know, roadkill like roads themselves are so abundant, uh, you know, we we ignore it or we, we blind ourselves to it. Uh, but, you know, in fact, more than a million vertebrate animals uh, are killed by cars every day in the U.S. Uh, and that's to say nothing of all of the pollinators and other insects uh, and arachnids that we're killing, right? But more than a million animals are being killed by cars every day. Uh, and it's not just, you know, the white-tailed deer and the gray squirrels and the raccoons and the other common species you see by the roadside. There are dozens of, you know, federally threatened and endangered species uh, for which uh, vehicle mortality is the leading cause of death, right? From Florida panthers to ocelots to tiger salamanders to Hawaiian geese. Uh, you know, there are, there are listed species uh, for which cars, cars pose truly a, an existential threat, right? So it's not just this kind of crisis of the common. There are lots of rare species being being killed as well. Uh, and in fact, as you know, researchers have observed, roads have become the leading direct human cause of vertebrate mortality on land, right? So think about that. There's literally nothing that we do, uh, you know, that kills more wild animals directly than than drive. I think that's that's uh, pretty, pretty astonishing. 
And, uh, you know, again, it's, it's, it's truly a, a global problem, right? I'm, I'm sharing a lot of American statistics, uh, but, you know, anywhere you go in the world, uh, you know, roadkill is truly one of the leading causes of death for, for threatened species from, you know, Asiatic cheetahs in Iran to Tasmanian devils in Australia uh, to uh, giant anteaters in, in Brazil. Uh, this is, you know, absolutely a, a global crisis and truly one of the forces contributing to this sixth mass extinction event uh, that we're uh, in the middle of uh, on, on planet Earth right now. You know, I think that roadkill is, is so damaging and, and pernicious in part because it, it subverts evolution, right? You think about the kind of the defense mechanisms and strategies of so many of our most common and beloved species, from turtles that withdraw into their shells, to skunks that spray, to porcupines that bristle their quills, right? These are kind of these stand your ground strategies that evolved over thousands of generations and, and worked really well uh, against coyotes and mountain lions and bobcats and other quote unquote natural predators. But, you know, when your predator is, uh, you know, an F-150 barreling down I-84 at uh, 80 miles an hour, you know, the worst possible thing you can do uh, is withdraw into your shell, right? Uh, so I, I find that really tragic to contemplate the way that traffic and modernity takes evolutionary history and, and renders it not only moot, but, but actually maladapted. So roadkill, you know, this collision between vehicle and animal is the most conspicuous way that roads shape nature, right? Again, we, you know, we've all seen the dead animal by the side of the road, but it's really just the tip of the iceberg. You know, in road ecology, this field of science that I'm, I'm writing about, uh, you know, really looks at all of these different interactions and connections and, and relationships between transportation infrastructure and nature. You know, we know that roads are uh, vectors of invasive species, right? We've all seen, you know, the roadside uh, dandelions, of course, being the most sort of conspicuous example of that. But there are lots and lots of examples uh, of, you know, non-native plant and animal populations that have basically infiltrated ecosystems along the transportation grid. Uh, you know, here's one example of that. This is an old logging road uh, that I visited in, in Montana. Uh, and for many decades, uh, logging trucks would transport the seeds of non-native thistles in the, the um, patterns of their, of their tires and their treads. Uh, and then, you know, one day all of those thistles kind of bloomed at once when the road was disturbed. And you have this eerie, you know, linear purple stripe uh, running across the, uh, the the landscape, which is pretty pretty wild to see. Uh, roads are zones of, of erosion, right? There are these hydrological and even geological forces. Uh, that's especially true of of dirt roads. You know, we have hundreds of thousands of miles of, of dirt road uh, in this country. You know, the U.S. Forest Service is actually the single largest road manager in the world, uh, unbeknownst to most people. You know, most of it old dirt logging roads, and certainly there's plenty of that in, in northern Minnesota. And, uh, you know, you get a big rainfall or, or snow melt event, you know, and, and those dirt roads just kind of turn liquid, you know, and that sediment runs off into rivers and lakes and smothers fish eggs and amphibian larvae and, and so on, right? So even these, these very low traffic rural uh, dirt roads, you know, have, have immense ecological impacts. <clears throat> Roads are sources of pollution, right? Our cars are constantly hemorrhaging cadmium and zinc and copper and microplastics and all kinds of stuff. And we're learning more about that kind of chemical connection all of the time. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, some researchers at the University of Washington in, in Seattle, uh, you know, published a, a paper basically finding that many decades of salmon die off were being caused by a chemical, 6-PPD, in tires, an, an ozone-protecting chemical that you know, nobody had ever heard of. Uh, but tire particles uh, containing this chemical were running off into, into streams around the Puget Sound watershed and killing coho salmon. Uh, and there are something like 6 million tons of tire particles that enter the planet's waterways every, every year. And so you know, this is the one place where it's been studied. Uh, but you know, surely these, these sorts of fish kills are, are happening uh, elsewhere. So again, you know, this the kind of the, the uh, there's this emerging frontier of research into kind of the, the chemical impacts of, of transportation, certainly including, including tire particles. 
One of those chemical interactions uh, is road salt, right? We apply 20 million tons of road salt to American highways every year as a, as a cheap de-icing agent. Uh, in fact, Minnesota is the, is the single largest user of road salt uh, among, among any state. Uh, and, you know, those, those, you know, that road salt addition to the environment is causing all kinds of issues. Uh, you know, it runs off into rivers and lakes and streams and wetlands, uh, turns, uh, you know, freshwater brackish, Something like half of the lakes in uh, in the Midwest are experiencing long-term salinization, so they're becoming saltier over time uh, as a result of, uh, of of road salting, uh, with you know, immense impacts to everything from frogs to trout to even zooplankton uh, are affected by uh, by by road salt. You know, road salt also creates these uh, these kind of dangerous wildlife conflicts, right? We've turned our uh, you know our, our national highway system into basically a, a you know a four million mile long salt lick uh, that attracts deer and moose and all kinds of other uh, creatures and you know lures them into these kind of dangerous conflicts with uh, with with vehicles uh, I will say that the road salt issue uh, inspired my favorite road sign this is in Jasper National Park uh, every winter you can see a sign saying do not let moose lick your car. I, I like that. I like that a lot. I'm not sure you could stop a moose from licking your car. I think if a moose wants to lick your car, he's probably going to do it. But, you know, you appreciate the, the sentiment there. Roads are also these hellscapes of noise, right? Uh, you know, the kind of the noise of, of engines and especially tires. Tires are actually at, at highway speeds, a, a larger source of noise than, than uh, engines. Uh, is a, an, enor an enormous form of habitat loss, right? You think about, you know, being a, a male meadowlark or any songbird who has to sing to attract a mate. Well, if your mate can't hear you over the, the noise of, uh, of, of vehicles, you fundamentally can't live in that place, right? Uh, and there's lots of research showing that road noise uh, drives birds away from, you know, from very large areas. So a road itself might only be 100 feet wide from shoulder to shoulder, but this kind of acoustic envelope that it creates, you know, can span uh, a mile or, or more in, in some cases. And, you know, it's certainly affecting all of the wildlife uh, within its, its uh, ambit. But it's not all doom and gloom, right? You know, roads are uh, are forces of habitat creation in some cases, as as well as uh, destruction. Uh, animals are sort of endlessly creative and flexible and adaptive, and they've you know figured out all kinds of ways of taking advantage of this concrete habitat we've created for them. Uh, when I was working on this this book, uh, you know, I, as I mentioned earlier, I, I you know spent a week in in Minnesota, and and uh, Chris Smith, a biologist with uh, with MinDOT, uh, took me to this highway overpass, uh, and in all of the crevices on the on the underside of the overpass, uh, you know, hundreds of little brown bats were roosting in those those crevices, right, taking advantage of this uh, this habitat we we created for them. Another really good example of road-related habitat are road sides, right? Uh, you know, in most of the Midwest, which is, uh, you know, sort of this corn and soy and lawn monoculture, you know, those road sides are some of the last uncultivated uh, strips of, of native prairie in, in some cases, uh, you know, and, and they've become really good reservoirs of habitat uh, for monarch butterflies, you know, who basically migrate from Minnesota to Texas along I-35 uh, and, uh, you know, and, and rusty patch bumblebees and all kinds of critters, you know, these, these roadsides are almost little wilderness areas in some cases. Um, but, you know, of course, they're also dangerous wilderness areas, right? Millions of, of monarchs uh, are killed by cars every year. Uh, you know, as we've been talking about, the road is this kind of very complex uh, chemical environment. Um, and, uh, you know, the Emily Snell Rood, who's a researcher at the University of Minnesota, has been studying this for many years. And I've got a chapter of, of the book is about this kind of monarch roadside connection. And, uh, you know, is, is the road basically producing more monarch butterflies uh, than it's killing? That's a, you know, a, a big question that's occupied lots of researchers for, uh, for, for, for many years. So the road is, it's a habitat, yes, but it's, you know, potentially a, a dangerous, uh, a dangerous habitat. Uh, and that's true for, for scavengers as well, right? We've created this kind of linear trail of carcasses uh, across the landscape uh, that, you know, ends up being really good, a really good resource for bald eagles and golden eagles and ravens and magpies and coyotes and raccoons and skunks and all kinds of other uh, other scavenging critters. Uh, you know, vultures have, have dramatically expanded their range, uh, you know, thanks to uh, thanks to, to 
carrion uh, provided by roads. But again, it's a, you know, a really dangerous situation for those animals in some cases, right? If you're a bald eagle with a, you know, a belly full of venison, it takes you a minute to achieve liftoff and, you know, you run the risk of being hit yourself. And actually thousands of eagles are killed by cars uh, every, every year. So again, the road is, uh, it's a resource, yes, but it's also potentially an, an ecological trap that, you know, lures animals into these dangerous situations. And of course, it's not just the animals themselves that are, are lured into these, these dangerous uh, situations. Of course, it's, it's us as, as drivers, right? Uh, you know, deer vehicle collisions, this interaction between, uh, you know, animal and car uh, is an immense, and I think largely unsung public health and safety crisis. Uh, you know, it's it's almost hard to uh, to fathom just how many deer vehicle collisions, DVCs, occur every year, and you know the uh, immense issues they cause. There are up to two million annual uh, DVCs in this country, right? So that's one every thirty seconds. Uh, so you know, as as we're talking, uh, you know, there there will be many many DVCs uh, in this in this country. Uh, you know, the average deer collision costs society more than nine thousand uh, dollars in hospital bills and vehicle repairs and insurance costs and tow trucks and you know all the rest of it, right? So they're really dangerous and expensive events. Uh, you know that are collectively costing society more than eight billion dollars a year. Uh, and you know, deer are the single most dangerous wild animal uh, in America as a result of deer vehicle collisions. Of course, it's not the deer's fault, right? It's the car's fault, uh, but you know, the deer are involved. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there are up to 400 drivers killed every year uh, in DVCs. And, you know, I, I know too, that's a, you know, I mean, everybody talked to you says that's a, that's a dramatic underestimate, right? Because a lot of, a lot of single car fatal incidents uh, are likely caused by swerving to avoid an animal. You know, somebody veers for a deer, hits a telephone pole, and there's no record of a collision. Um, but you know, that's a that's a a, a deer a deer related incident as well, right? So, uh, you know, certainly there are many hundreds and and possibly thousands of drivers killed uh, as a result of, uh, of of animal incidents uh, every every year. Uh, and of course, you know, Minnesota, as anybody who's driven around uh, the state can attest, is, you know, one of the kind of the hotbeds uh, for this issue. There is something like 40,000 uh, deer collisions in Minnesota every year, which is something like one every 12 to 15 minutes. Uh, so these are, you know, again, really common, really dangerous events uh, that I think, uh, you know, largely go unreported. And of course, you know, deer aren't the only animal out there, right? There are some bigger critters as well. The average moose collision costs society more than $40,000. And that's probably something that you guys have experience with in the, uh, the northern part of the state. Uh, and of course, you know, moose are just a much bigger animal, uh, much higher fatality rates and, and crashes uh, for humans. Uh, and so they're, you know, a much more expensive and, and dangerous uh, animal to, to interact with in a car. So historically, you know, the way that transportation departments have, have handled this conflict between animals and wildlife is by putting up signs, right? We've all seen these, you know, these classic yellow diamonds with the leaping black buck. Uh, and, you know, I'll just, I'll just tell you, you know, based on sort of empirical data, what I, I bet you've intuited, which is that these things really don't work, right? There are just so many of them. They're kind of put up in this scattershot way. Uh, you know, often not a very systematic fashion. Um, you know, they've become kind of visual pollution and, and white noise on the landscape. Uh, you know, often you see this sort of thing, right? Deer crossing next 30 miles. I mean, no driver is going to remain alert uh, for 30 miles with, you know, her foot on the brake waiting for a, a deer to leap into the road, right? So lots of research showing that, you know, conventional signage is, is, uh, is basically ineffective. Uh, and, you know, nevertheless, it's, it's become kind of the default solution for transportation departments truly all over the world, right? You can see, you know, animal signs in, on, on every continent in practically every country. Uh, and, you know, as some transportation officials have admitted, you know, it's basically this cheap, very visible public expression of concern, right? We're aware of the problem. We're doing something about it. Check out this sign, you know? Uh, and, uh, and that's, you know, that's, a, that's often transportation department's way of, of you know, acknowledging the issue um, without truly uh, addressing it. Um, and in fact, I've heard, you know, some, some biologists call signs litter on sticks, right? Just because of their kind of ubiquity and, and, uh, and, and uselessness and their, you know, their, their visual pollution uh, nature along the, uh, along the, the roadside. Uh, and you know, I'll, I'll point out too that, look, even if signs were effective, right? Even if signs did mitigate 
you know, the point of impact, the collision between animal and vehicle, they wouldn't be solving the problem that roads create because really those collisions are only half of the problem. In some ways, the bigger problem, at least for, for wild animal standpoint, uh, is the barrier effect, right? The fact that so many of our highways, especially our interstates, have these constant streams of traffic moving along them that basically prevent animals from even attempting to cross highways, right? This kind of moving fence of vehicles, uh, as uh, you know, some some biologists have have called it. And you know, one illustration of uh, of this this point, this you know, kind of the, the the problem caused by the the barrier effect occurs in southwestern Wyoming. That's one of the places I went uh, working on this book uh, to visit this herd of, of mule deer you know, close sister species to white-tailed deer uh, who live in the red desert in southwestern Wyoming. Uh, and, you know, these are migratory deer. So they walk, you know, hundreds of miles round trip from their winter range to their summer range up in the up in the mountains. And, you know, for many years, scientists have been putting these satellite collars on them to basically watch where they go and see where they hang out. Uh, and, you know, what these researchers have learned is that these deer basically never cross I-80, which crosses southwestern Wyoming, right? So these purple blobs here, these are basically where the deer hang out, uh, you know, in the winter. Uh, and this, this white line across the bottom of the screen, that's I-80. And you can see very clearly uh, that the deer never cross I-80, essentially, right? Because, again, they're not even trying to cross, right? There's just this constant stream of vehicles that they can't penetrate. Uh, and in harsh winters, you know, they'll pool up uh, on the north side of the highway looking for a way across because all of the good winter range is south of the interstate. Uh, but they can't get they can't get through that that moving fence of traffic. Uh, and in some years, you know, 40 percent of that deer herd will actually starve uh, because they can't reach that, uh, you know, that that really good forage, uh, you know, south of the interstate. Right. So. You know, that's in, in some ways, again, a, a bigger issue than, uh, you know, than, than roadkill itself. You know, a herd of deer, they can handle a few collisions on the highway. You know, what they can't handle uh, is the loss of access to all of that, uh, that, that prime habitat. Here's another uh, map illustrating a similar point. This is, uh, these are the movements of a, a satellite collared young male grizzly bear in Montana. Uh, and this white line is I-90, uh, and every red X is a place where that bear approached the highway and, you know, bounced off like a ping pong ball, re repelled by that, that constant stream of traffic, right? So over the course of six months, you know, this bear tried to cross uh, I-90 more than 40 times uh, before he finally finally found a way across on the uh, the far left side of the screen, right? But for six months, this highway was preventing this bear from dispersing into you know into into the habitat he was trying to get to. You know, he could he could literally stand on on the north side of the highway and look across at the mountains uh, where he wanted to be on the south side and and was you know unable to reach them for a very long time, right? So, again, you know, a road is. 100 feet wide from shoulder to shoulder, and yet it's denying animals access to, you know, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of acres of, of, uh, of really good habitat. Here's another point, you know, or another map, rather, illustrating kind of a similar point. These are mountain lion locations in Southern California, just west of uh, Los Angeles. Uh, and all of these red lines here are freeways, right? These are some of the busiest freeways on Earth, you know, the 101, the 405, uh, you know, taking traffic into and out of L.A. Uh, and what you can see here very clearly, right, is that each mountain lion, each color is an individual mountain lion. Uh, and you can see that those, you know, those lions never cross uh, the 101, right? That, you know, giant freeway that's conveying 300,000 cars a day, uh, you know, to and from Los Angeles. Uh, and as a result, you know, those animals have become uh, incredibly inbred, right? No new mountain lions can enter the population. So that little cluster, that little island of, of cats, you know, they're stuck mating with their own daughters and granddaughters and great granddaughters, right? And they've begun to suffer genetic defects as a result of all of that inbreed, inbreeding. Uh, and, you know, they've entered what scientists have called an extinction vortex, you know, this long-term doom spiral, uh, you know, caused by those, those, uh, those genetic issues. So we have these kind of two linked problems, right? We have we have wildlife vehicle collisions, you know, these, these really dangerous uh, interactions between animals and cars, you know, the, that point of impact. And then we've got that barrier effect, uh, you know, created by, uh, by highways that's preventing animals from moving around the landscape uh, and, you know, leading to these genetic problems and, and, uh, and habitat loss issues. So how do we solve those two 
linked and, and related problems. And, you know, really the best tool that we have uh, at our disposal are, are wildlife crossings, right? These overpasses, underpasses, tunnels, various structures uh, that permit animals to move across, across the highway safely, uh, you know, without running afoul of, of, uh, of, of vehicles. And, you know, wildlife crossings, this concept really begins in, in the 1950s in France, uh, you know, where they're they built all of these game bridges, mostly for for deer. Uh, you know, this this idea spreads pretty rapidly uh, to uh, Germany, Switzerland, Austria, other other Western European countries. Uh, you know, the Netherlands is today kind of considered the world's leader in this uh, this this technology. Uh, has the highest density of wildlife crossings per you know kilometer of road uh, in the world. Uh, this is a very famous Dutch overpass that spans two highways, a a, a railroad track, a sports complex complex and a business park. It's a kilometer long. Uh, this just amazing, amazing green bridge. Um, so the Netherlands and other Western European countries are, you know, kind of doing this the most and, and uh, you know, in, in some cases the best even. Um, you know, the place where wildlife crossings really became famous uh, and, you know, the place that contributed, I think, the most to their spread uh, was Banff National Park in Canada, right? And, and Banff, you know, like so many national parks around the world, uh, is sort of split in half by a highway, the Trans-Canada Highway, you know, runs through the, the middle of it. Um, and in the 1980s, Parks Canada began building these wildlife crossings, underpasses and a handful of overpasses uh, to permit elk and wolves and deer and bears and all kinds of other creatures to move back and forth uh, across the, the Trans-Canada Highway uh, safely. And, you know, when this when this work in Banff began, you know, nobody was quite sure whether wildlife crossings were effective, right? They hadn't really been rigorously studied in, in, in many places. Um, and, you know, so Banff had this, in addition to building all these crossings, you know, they set up this kind of state-of-the-art uh, research program to study animal usage of these, these passages. Uh, and, you know, those, those overpasses in particular, you know, they really built those for grizzly bears, right? You know, some look very intuitively, some animals like to go under highways, some like to go over, uh, and, and grizzly bears are definitely over crossers. Uh, you know, they're these big, powerful animals that want to be out in the open, uh, you know, to confront their, their enemies head on. Uh, they don't want to be in, you know, some dark tunnel. They want to be up on the deck of a bridge. So they built these overpasses for grizzly bears. And, you know, what they found very clearly was that you know, they worked really well. These bears were moving back and forth uh, over the highway uh, atop, uh, atop these overpasses. Uh, they were breeding on either side, right? So that kind of genetic divide was being healed essentially by, by the, uh, the overpass. And then what was really exciting is that the, the sows, the female bears, would take their cubs across and their cubs would become crossers. And then they would teach their own cubs. Uh, so there's this whole sort of intergenerational learning phenomenon uh, that, uh, that happened in, uh, in, Banff, in Banff's grizzly bear population, which is pretty, pretty cool to see. So as a result of, you know, of all of that research demonstrating the efficacy of, of uh, you know, this technology, uh, you know, this, this, these kinds of Banffian overpasses, uh, you know, spread pretty rapidly. Now you can find them in Argentina and uh, Singapore uh, and, you know, certainly all over the American West. Um, and again, you know, Banff is really probably the most significant project in the history of this, you know, road ecology movement that uh, I, I write about in the book. So, you know, here in the U.S., the first wildlife crossings really start to pop up in the 1970s. Uh, and they're, they're at first, they're you know, pretty much all in Western states. Right. And the reason for that is that Western states, you know, Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, they have these big migratory herds uh, of deer and elk and antelope, you know, these, you know, thousands of animals all sort of moving together uh, in these very predictable seasonal migrations. Uh, so if you get, you know, a thousand mule deer all crossing the same Wyoming highway in the same place every year, and 50 of them get hit by cars, there's this big pile of carcasses saying, hey, put the wildlife crossing right here, right? Those Western migratory ungulate herds uh, tend to be pretty easy to mitigate for, whereas uh, you know, in, in the Midwest and the Northeast, uh, there are just sort of like white-tailed deer all over the place all of the time, right? It's, it's a little bit harder to identify discrete hotspots for mitigation, uh, which is why Eastern states don't readily adopt this concept, but that's, you know, starting to change. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. But just to say that, you know, Western states historically uh, have been sort of the, the leaders uh, in wildlife crossing construction because, the, you know, they have this suite of migratory ungulate fauna uh, that kind of lends itself to, uh, you know, to this, this solution. <clears throat> 
So one of the things that uh, you know engineers at these various Western DOTs figure out pretty quickly is that look if these wildlife crossings are going to be effective, uh, you know they have to be they have to be paired with fences, right? Fences are integral. People always say, you know, how do the animals know to use the crossings? And basically the answer is you fence the roadsides. And you know you force the deer or the elk or the moose to follow that fence line until he finds the underpass or overpass, and you're basically using the fences to funnel animals to the crossings, right? So you know the fences keep the animals off the highway and keep them safe, and then the wildlife crossings provide them the opportunity to move back and forth across the highway and, and reconnect that habitat. So those two elements, the passages and the fences, you know, really have to be paired together, uh, you know, for these uh, these these projects to work. Uh, another, you know, kind of key piece of infrastructure are jump outs, which are basically these one way uh, escape ramps. So if, you know, somehow the deer break through the fence and find themselves trapped on the highway, uh, they can find one of these exit ramps to, uh, to to get out of there. So this is another, you know, sort of unsung, but but really uh, important uh, piece of making these uh, these wildlife crossing projects work. And you know, over time, another another really important lesson uh, that lots of these these DOTs learn is that you know you really want a diversity of wildlife crossings, and you want diverse types of habitat on those wildlife crossings, right? You know, yes, lots of crossings get built for elk and deer and moose and other big critters, but you know there are also amphibians and reptiles and rodents and mustelids, you know, the weasel family, uh, all, you know, all of these different critters out there, all of them, uh, you know, being divided by the, uh, the highway. And if, you know, if you're going to uh, help the entire ecosystem, you know, you have to accommodate all of those different critters, right? Again, there are some animals that like to go over highways, some that like to go under, some that, you know, that need these logs and rocks and other habitat features atop the, uh, the wildlife crossing. This is a, an overpass uh, on I-90, just outside of Seattle, up on uh, Snoqualmie Pass, uh, and this gets used by you know by elk all the time. Uh, but it also gets you it also gets used by western toads and alligator lizards and jumping mice and all kinds of other critters. And you know the the uh, the designers of this this structure you know bolted all of these logs into place to provide some uh, you know some kind of hiding places for all of those those smaller critters as well. Uh, they also built a bunch of underpasses in this area because again you know there's some some species like uh, you know, like mountain lions, especially, uh, you know, that seem to prefer to go to go under uh, under highways. And, you know, so they, they provided these kind of big capacious underpasses uh, with, you know, where the highway is basically paired. Um, so you get, you know, light coming through between the lanes, which is really nice, just creates a more kind of natural uh, ambiance. Uh, you can see this kind of line of rocks uh, that they, they built, uh, you know, through this underpass. And that basically, you know, provides kind of a linear corridor for reptiles and pikas and other animals that live in those talus slopes, right? So again, you're just trying to, you know, accommodate the whole ecosystem. Uh, and, you know, that, that project, uh, that kind of network of, of wildlife crossings on I-90 also includes uh, a bunch of expanded culverts, right? Uh, you know, there are lots of kind of stream-associated aquatic animals, otters, beavers, salamanders, uh, you know, and you, you need to give them an opportunity as well uh, to, to, to use those stream crossings to get back and forth uh, under highways. So, you know, a bunch of expanded culverts, uh, you know, provided that, op that opportunity. So again, just thinking about the whole, the whole ecosystem is, is really, really critical. So, you know, I, I really like talking about culverts um, because, you know, people people tend to ignore them, but they actually end up being really good functional wildlife crossings, right? And culverts, because you guys are all, you know, transportation people, you know this, although I think the, the general public most generally does not know what a culvert is. Uh, but, you know, culverts are all of these, you know, these metal or concrete pipes and passages, you know, primarily designed to transport water under roadways and other infrastructure. Um, and, you know, so they're not, they're not, purpose built for animals, uh, but, you know, they end up being really good animal passages. You know, wildlife often finds culverts and uses them. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot we can do, I think, to make our culverts even more functional as wildlife crossings. So here's one example of that. This is a, uh, a culvert in uh, Montana under uh, Highway 93, uh, just north of Missoula. And this is basically a culvert that connects two seasonal wetlands. So, you know, half the year, the culvert, the bottom of the culvert has water in it. And when there's water in the culvert, you know, it's it's no longer functional for bobcats and skunks and all kinds of other critters that don't want to get their paws wet. 
So you know what these what uh, some some uh, MDT biologists did was basically install these critter shells. You know these these metal catwalks uh, that allow animals to move back and forth uh, through this culvert when you know there's six inches of standing water uh, in the in the pipe. So you know I think that's pretty cool, right? There's not every not every wildlife crossing project has to be you know a ten million dollar overpass. There's a lot we can do with the existing infrastructure that's already on the landscape uh, through you know cheap tweaks and retrofits on, on behalf of wildlife. Another really good example of that uh, is in Virginia. You know, Virginia, like so many Eastern states, I think historically basically said, you know, look, there are deer all over the place. We can't really deal with this problem. You know, we don't really have discrete roadkill hotspots like those Western states do. So we're not gonna worry about it. Uh, but, you know, uh, a few years ago, some of the, the VDOT biologists had this bright idea, which is that, you know, let's work with the culverts we already have, right? So this is this is a culvert under I-64, uh, you know, big interstate that, uh, you know, has lots of deer collisions. Uh, and, you know, basically what VDOT did was they, they fenced the roadside on either side of a couple of these culverts that they already had on the landscape, right? So again, these were not purpose-built wildlife crossings. They were, you know, there for the kind of the seasonal conveyance of water and cattle. Um, but, you know, they said, hey, if, you know, if we force the animals to use these crossings, I bet they will use them. Uh, so, you know, VDOT fenced uh, a few miles of uh, I-64, you know, they reduced uh, collisions with animals by more than 90% um, because of course the animals can't you know, walk across the surface of the highway anymore. Uh, they forced deer to use these culverts, right? They saw a fourfold increase in deer usage of these underpasses, uh, as well as black bears, foxes, opossums, all kinds of other critters were, you know, using those wildlife crossings because the fences guided them there. Uh, and, you know, I think what's the most important part of this project, at least from a, you know, a DOT standpoint, is that, you know, this project actually recouped its own costs in under two years, right? If you reduce collisions by 90%, you're preventing huge numbers of expensive, dangerous wildlife vehicle collisions, and you're saving the public a lot of money, right? So this was, you know, something like a, I forget exactly what the, the cost of this project was, but, you know, a half million dollars or something like that. Uh, and, you know, it, it paid for itself in, you know, a year, a year and change. Uh, which was, uh, you know, pretty, pretty cool. So again, you know, there's, there's so much we can do with the existing infrastructure that's already on the landscape with, you know, fencing and critter shelves and other, other cheap tweaks and retrofits, right? There's, there's lots of opportunities out there to improve habitat connectivity for wildlife and save the public a lot of money, right? I think that's a, a really important point as well is that, yes, you know, wildlife passage and habitat co connectivity, you know, it's good conservation policy, but it's also good fiscal policy. Uh, and there's, you know, lots and lots of uh, studies out there basically showing that these structures pay for themselves really quickly through collision prevention, right? This is a, a wildlife overpass in uh, Wyoming that was built for migrating deer and, and uh, antelope. And, you know, when it was proposed, I think lots of people at YDOT, you know, said, really, are we, you know, we're going to spend $5 million helping antelope cross the road uh, but you know this structure uh, and the fences alongside it paid for themselves in, in uh, under five years uh, by again preventing all of these uh, these expensive crashes so you know good conservation policy good fiscal policy uh, you know these these structures are really you know wins on on many levels uh, <clears throat> I, I will say that you know because we have tended, and we sort of the royal we as American society, you know, we, we've we've tended to mitigate for those animals that endanger human life and safety, right? You know, we take this very kind of cost benefit oriented approach, uh, which guides us to mitigation for deer and elk and moose and other, you know, big dangerous animals that total your car and kill you when you hit them, right? Um, and that's, you know, that's great. I'm of course all for, you know, more deer and, uh, and moose passages. But, you know, I'd, I'd point out too that, look, there are so many other critters out there, uh, you know, that that are being, you know, flattened and fatally fragmented uh, by roadways, right? Amphibians and reptiles, especially, you know, some, some of the most endangered creatures uh, in the United States, um, you know, in large part because they're hit by cars. Uh, and, you know, we, we have tended not to mitigate for those animals because look, nobody's ever totaled their car, uh, you know, hitting Northern red-legged frogs or garter snakes uh, or, you know, or, or uh, other, other small, you know, herpida fauna. Um, and yet, you know, again, these are, these are animals that are existentially threatened by, by vehicles. And if we're gonna save them, you know, I think we need to rethink our 
uh, our perspective on wildlife crossings to some extent, right? We can't just mitigate for you know the big dangerous stuff. We have to we have to mitigate for the smaller stuff as well that doesn't threaten our safety, um, but you know is is truly at sort of conservation risk uh, because of, uh, of of vehicles. Uh, I will say that uh, you know that, that Minnesota is one of the few states that has done something about this. Uh, on Highway Four in in Washington County, there's a a, a turtle underpass, uh, a turtle tunnel. Uh, there's a painted turtle using the uh, the, the turtle tunnel. Pretty cool. Um, I think uh, yeah, Chris Chris Smith with MnDOT told me that uh, at the at the the ribbon cutting for the turtle tunnel, there were a bunch of uh, like you know Harley riders, uh, you know, in their leather vests, because if you know if you hit a, if you hit a turtle uh, on your motorcycle, you know that's like that's like hitting a boulder, right? So they you know these these guys were all in favor of the uh, of the the turtle tunnel, which is which is pretty cool. So you know just to say, you know these these sorts of projects are effective. They're you know really important from a conservation standpoint, um, and we need to be doing more of that sort of thing, right? Building crossings for the entire ecosystem, uh, not just for the you know the large the large mammals. Uh, and I'll add that you know other other countries tend to be uh, in some ways better about this than we are. You know, uh, there's a, a very famous uh, set of overpasses for migrating red, red crabs on, on Christmas Island. You know, all of these crabs that uh, you know move between rainforest and and coastline to spawn every year, and they've built these you know spectacular overpasses for them. Uh, and it's sort of hard to imagine uh, the United States building overpasses for for red crabs. Um, but you know, that's the sort of thing that uh, other other countries are doing, which is which is pretty exciting. Uh, another kind of cool form of wildlife crossing are, are arboreal crossings, right? There are all of these little forest fragments out there that are divided by roads. And, you know, lots of creatures that are not going to descend to the, the forest floor to use a conventional uh, underpass, but, you know, we'll use all of these rope ladders and bridges that connect forest fragments at the level of the canopy, right? There are, you know, sloths in Costa Rica and howler monkeys and gibbons in Southeast Asia that are all using these, uh, you know, spectacular arboreal uh, overpasses that were, were built uh, for their express use. Um, this is a, a squirrel glider in Australia. Uh, you know, using a, 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 a little rope ladder to move between forest fragments. Uh, and look, you know, here in the U.S., we have plenty of arboreal fauna, too. You know, we, we have uh, flying squirrels and porcupines and martens and all kinds of critters that would benefit from this sort of these sorts of canopy crossings. Uh, but again, we haven't done this sort of thing um, because we tend to take a, uh, you know, a very large mammal centric uh, approach to, uh, to, to wildlife mitigation. And you know, I, I just want to emphasize this is this is truly a uh, you know a global movement to reconnect habitats, right? I mean, everywhere you go, uh, particularly in the developing world, you know, you see uh, these sorts of structures. You know, there are underpasses for uh, tapirs and anteaters and pumas in Brazil. Uh, you know, Nepal has some some really strong uh, laws requiring uh, wildlife crossings with new highway construction in, in forested areas for tigers and rhinos and all kinds of other other creatures. Uh, you know, Kenya's built uh, a bunch of underpasses for uh, the movement of elephants. Just think about how big an underpass you need to uh, to pass a herd of elephants, right? Um, and you know, some of the coolest stuff is is happening in uh, in in India. Uh, you know, India. Like many developing countries, is you know building uh, a lot of infrastructure from scratch right now, and you know they're able to learn from our mistakes in 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 a sense. You know, here in the U.S., we built our interstate highway system in the middle of the 20th century before we understood uh, how catastrophic it was going to be for wild animals. But you know, countries that are building from scratch today can again learn from those errors, uh, you know, assimilate uh, you know, many decades of road ecology research and, and apply that in their construction. So India, you know, has several places where highways have been elevated on these concrete pillars for many miles. And instead of having, you know, isolated underpasses, uh, the entire forest floor is wide open so that animals can, you know, move back and forth safely. So, you know, there's a, a lot of creative stuff uh, happening in uh, in, you know, in, in, outside of the U.S. and uh, and Western Europe, uh, that you know we could learn a lot from. I think. Uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll add as well that you know this is a, a really exciting time in some in some respects for wildlife crossings, right? That the 2021 Infrastructure Act uh, included something called the Wildlife Crossings Pilot Program, a, a 350 million dollar competitive grant program 
uh, that will that's going to fund new wildlife crossings uh, around the country. And the, you know, the first round of that uh, funding was was uh, allocated in December. Um, and you know, a lot of the projects that got funded were you know in those western states like Colorado and Utah and, and Montana that have been doing this work for years. But it was also really exciting to see Kentucky and Missouri and South Dakota and Pennsylvania uh, get funding for uh, for wildlife passages as, as well as this you know this concept gradually moves eastward uh, from the Rocky Mountains to the Midwest and the and the Northeast right so this is you know this has gone from being kind of a regional uh, technology to to truly a, a national one and that's you know that's that's really exciting. Uh, and I'll add that, uh, you know, that there's also there's also a billion dollars in the Infrastructure Act for new culverts. You know, culverts are a huge form of, uh, of their huge barriers to fish movement, right? You know, narrow, tight culverts basically concentrate stream flows and, you know, prevent fish from migrating upstream to spawn. Uh, and, you know, by replacing all of those crappy metal pipes with, you know, bigger sort of you know, stream simulation box culverts that kind of allow the the stream to you know do its thing naturally and spread out. You know, you can we can create uh, you know these these really wonderful uh, fish passages as well. And there's a, again a billion dollars uh, for for culvert replacement in the Infrastructure Act, which is you know exciting for all the all the culvert nerds. So you know, ulti ultimately, both the the task and the challenge and the opportunity before us is to, you know, remake our infrastructure on behalf of biodiversity on this planet, right? Again, we know that we're in the middle of this sixth extinction event uh, in our planet's history, you know, uh, common species are becoming rare, rare species are going extinct, you know, we're hemorrhaging uh, wildlife and, and biodiversity, uh, you know, here in the in the U.S. and, and beyond, and, and our infrastructure is an enormous part of that, you know, again, as I, as I said at the start of this uh, webinar, there's literally nothing that we do that kills more wild animals on land directly than drive, right, so if we're going to save, if we're going to save biodiversity, uh, you know, we truly have to rethink our built environment, and, you know, here's one example of that. Um, this is an underpass for ocelots in South Texas, and there are fewer than 100 ocelots left in the United States, and car collisions are 40% of ocelot mortality, right? So this is a, a, you know, a federally listed species that we are losing right now uh, because of, of vehicles, and if we're going to save ocelots and so many other species, uh, you know, we have to accommodate for their, their movement uh, across the landscape. So with that, I'll just say that uh, you know if uh, you know if this conversation merely whet your appetite for uh, you know more juicy road ecology content, uh, I do have a new book uh, called Crossings that came out this fall uh, on this uh, this subject. Um, I'll just add uh, that the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, among other publications, uh, seem to love it. So you know, liberals and conservatives, uh, you know, united around this cause. And you know, I say that somewhat facetiously, but you know, truly, wildlife crossings are one of the few absolutely nonpartisan environmental issues out there right they pull incredibly well they you know they're one of the only things that the hunt that, that the hunting lobby and the humane society can agree on uh you know they they are uh, tr yeah, truly truly nonpartisan in a in a hyper polarized world and i think that's one of the uh the, the really exciting things about them um so with that i'll say uh thank thanks again to uh to uh kyle and the rest of the team for having me.